right? Uh, Tommy, I don't know how you can do, do so much. Uh, we want to welcome Tommy, and let's welcome him. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And Pastor Mark, it is great to be here with all of you guys this morning. And, you know, I never thought I would be on this journey uh, that God has called me on. And when I graduated from uh, high school, my parents, many of you guys who are listening are Asian and Chinese. So my mom says to me, Pick, uh, go to doctor, engineer, or lawyer. Pick one. So I said, okay, I guess I really enjoy chemistry. I guess I'm going to be a doctor. I went to apply for Washington University in St. Louis and got into their medical program, a seven-year medical program, right? And from that point on, after the first semester, I realized, man, God did not call me to be a doctor. I'm not sure if I enjoy doing that. And so as a result, I went to the business school at Washington University in St. Louis, Graduated from that, and then from that point, I built cell towers, telecommunications towers, for about 12 years. But during that period of time, I'm at my church in Chinatown, where some of you guys were, and so I'm working with our high school and college students. And the big question I ask myself is, Lord, are you calling me to go into full-time ministry? And my thought was full-time ministry at that time was pastoral ministry, right? So now I'm taking classes at night at Moody Seminary here in Chicago. And so after I graduated, I went and worked in a church, a Korean church. I, I wanted something new of all places. And for about three years, I was a pastor and realized, man, God did not call me to be a pastor. I'm not sure if I enjoy doing that. I just was not wired to do that. So then from that point, I worked to work at a Bible school, Moody Bible Institute, where my title was special assistant to the president. I did major donors, founders week, and pastors conference. I realized the nonprofit ministry is too slow for me. It's too hierarchy. It's too top down. I'm not sure if I enjoy doing that. So now for the last 15 years, I get a chance, as Pastor Mark says, we started Resource Global that works with young Christian marketplace leaders in different global cities. We started in Jakarta, Indonesia. Then we went to Singapore and Chicago and Kuala Lumpur, Nairobi, Austin. From that point on, we roam over to, we're starting one in Los Angeles, in South Africa, here at Houston and Sydney in the next couple of years. And then from that point on, Northern Seminary Con says, can you do the same thing that you did at Resource Global with ministry leaders and pastors? Because many of these pastors from around the world, ministry leaders, Christian lay leaders, cannot afford your full-time seminary that many American seminaries offer. So then we started doing that. I get a chance to now operate as the executive director of Together LA. We opened up a business in Indonesia called City Leadership Center. And so I get a chance to work with different other groups as well too. But the whole idea is, how has God trained and created you? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that because all of us individually are designed uniquely by God. Each one of us has a certain story that is unique to all of our lives. As you're sitting here listening to me right now, your story is unique. Your story is different. And God has made that story unique with all of the adventure, with the different chapters in your life. Now, where are we, why is God calling us to go? What do we need to do? That becomes the question that all of us will have to ask. And if we could start off our, our sermon title today is The Road Unknown. And we're going to take a look at Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And let me read that as well too. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. I'm reading from the ESV. And they set out from Shittim. And they, being the Israelites, came out to the Jordan, he and all of the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. You should, yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. 
Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass out on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the Lord. The Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. We're going to look at five questions this morning that emerges out of these eight verses. Questions that emerges that guides us as we look at these different verses. And we're going to see exactly what God is teaching us in this theme of the road unknown. Because all of us who are sitting here will have to cross that road unknown. All of us sitting here will get to a point where you don't know what to do. Where you're trying to figure out, Lord, what is it that you're calling me to do? What is it that you want me to do to continue to follow you? Five questions. Number one, first question is this. And I hope a lot of times, and Mark, a lot of times I am trying to figure out. Here we go. Question number one. What happens to Joshua in chapter one that sets us up for what happens in chapter three? Chapter three, verse one begins with this word. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. And they set out from Shidom. They rose early in the morning. And he knows that this day is there. After 40 years of living in the promised land. After their time in Egypt in slavery. It is now time to pack up. It is now time to go into this promised land. And so the question begins, what happens to Joshua in chapter 1 and 2 that sets us up for what happens in chapter 3? If you remember what happens in chapter 1, some of you guys have read this. He tells him at the beginning, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over the Jordan, you and all of this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. God tells Joshua, Joshua, your leader, Moses, the guy who has been your mentor for so many years, the guy who led you guys out of uh, slavery in Egypt, the guy who took you guys through the Red Sea and parted Red Sea, you know that person? The one who brought you the Ten Commandments, who you thought was going to lead you to the promised land? Joshua, he's not going to be there. Moses, your leader, is dead. It's on you now, Joshua. You're going to be the one that leads everyone there. You're going to be the one that will have to give, bring them to the promised land. And he says to this, only be strong and very courageous. Be strong because you're going to have to lead this group after 40 years in the wilderness to a place where they don't know, you have to be strong and very courageous. And how you're going to do that, you have to be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. And you're going to be strong and successful when you do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it on the day and the night so that you may be careful to do everything according to all that is written to it. Chapter one begins with the whole fact that let's put the whole situation in reality. Moses, your leader. Moses, the guy you followed. Moses, the person you're looking into. He's dead. Let's just get that out of the way. Joshua, you're going to be the one that leads them to it. And Joshua, it is not going to be easy. Because later on, he finds out in chapter 2, when he sends the spies over to Jericho, they're not welcoming them there. Those guys in Jericho, those guys in the promised land, they heard that the Israelites are coming. There's this God who brought them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. They've been living in the promised land, for this wilderness, for 40 years. And now they're about to cross the Jordan River 
and they're coming to the promised land. They're not just going to come over and say, here you go, everyone. They're going to try to get rid of you. You're going to take their home. And Joshua, it will not be easy. People are going to be complaining. People are going to be critical. You're not going to know what to do. You're going to be scared. So Joshua, my words to you is to be strong and very courageous. Very, very courageous. And how you're going to do that, and we're going to talk more about that, do not turn from the words of this mouth, to meditate it on it day and night. And those are the words that Joshua hits. And we head into verse 1. He rose early in the morning. He knows what is at stake. And he sets out from Shidom. And he tells them, and they came to the Jordan, he and all of the people at Israel. Today is a day which leads us to the second question. As the Israelites are going into packing up for the last time, ready to go to the promised land, what do you think was going through the minds of the Israelites as they were packing up for the final time in a home they lived with in for 40 years? For 40 years, they lived in this wilderness. For 40 years, some of the kids were born in that wilderness. For 40 years, they lived on this thing called manna, a rice little cake. For 40 years, they lived on it. It's not the best, but they lived on it for 40 years. At night for 40 years, a flame came in and gave them warmth and, po- and gave them light. For 40 years in the wilderness, this is what happened. And after 40 years, the day comes, and now they are ready to pack up. What do you think went through their mind as they were packing up, knowing that after 40 years, in the home they lived in 40 years, it is now time to go. For some of you guys, you've lived in the home for 10 years. You've lived in your parents' home for 20 years. Your parents, look, my parents lived in Chinatown, Chicago. They've lived there for over 20 years. There's a lot of stuff if they have ever have to pack up and leave. I just moved in the house that I lived to within four years. There's a lot of stuff to pack. They now live, they are ready to leave a home they live for 40 years. It depends on who you ask, right? There are some, the older ones who came out of Egypt into the promised land, they probably passed. Some of the younger guys, like Joshua, who are now older, they were probably in the prime of their life when they were in slavery in Egypt. They remember the slavery in Egypt. They remember packing up and leaving through the Red Sea. They remember all that. They remember the early days when Moses brought them there in the Ten Commandments. These guys were the prime in their life. They were the leaders. They were the warriors back in those days. They now are the elders of this group of the Israelites. A day they have been thinking about for 40 years. The day where God has promised them for 40 years is finally there. There is a little worry, but there is excitement. That's that group. You have some of those who were babies when they were just in Egypt. They don't remember anything about what happened in Egypt. They remember probably sitting on a cart and donkey going through the Red Sea. But for the majority of their homes, their type, they've lived in the wilderness. That has been their home. They are now your leaders. They're now your warriors. They're now in the prime of their life. They're worried because if there is battle... Those guys are the ones who will have to take care of everything. And so, yes, they do remember a little bit. Moses is kind of, they kind of remember Moses. But there's, we've already sent out two spies. They're coming to get us. So there's a little hesitation. Maybe the youngest ones, the ones who were born in the wilderness, who are just growing up right now. They're excited, but similar to their parents, Man, why can't we stay in the wilderness? Why can't we just stay where we are? You know, when we go to the promised land, they're going to try to kill us. They're not going to just turn over their home to us, their lands. Can we just stay in the wilderness? We're fine with there. We've been living there for 40 years. 
depends on who you ask. There's so many different feelings that, go or, that are going through their mind. But you're now going out as a community, isn't it? And we find this even in church as well, too. That as Christ followers, you are not alone. That even though I am speaking here, and I'm just getting to know you, I don't know where some of you guys are watching from. It could be in Chicago, it could be other parts of the U.S., it could be parts of the other world. We don't know. But as a community, with all of our differences in opinions, with all of our feelings, with all of our stories, our unique stories, we go together with our feelings, with our thoughts. And so it depends on who you ask with number two. There's anticipation, there's fear, there's wondering, there's excitement, there's, are you sure we should be doing that? All of this stuff. But we go forth as a community. And they came to the Jordan, he and all of the people in Israel, and lodged there for three days as they pass over. At the end of the three days, the officers went sent throughout the camp and commanded the people, which leads us to question number three. Why do you think Joshua had them camp out at the base of the Jordan River for three days? They packed up. Now they get to the Jordan River. Joshua, go do your thing and part the Jordan River. What are you gonna do? I want you guys to sit there for three days. And I want you to stare at the Jordan River for three days. Do you know what's happening at the Jordan River during that time? Chapter 3 doesn't, you don't need to turn to it. But here's what happens. In chapter 3, verse 17, and it tells us about the Jordan River. Now the Jordan is overflowing all its banks during this time of harvest is what happens says in chapter verse 17. So Joshua, you are actually asking us to pack up, go to the Jordan River during this time of harvest in the middle when the waters are raging and it's crazy. And you want us to cross the Jordan River during this time. And now for the next three days, We're staring at the Jordan River so we can see how high the rivers are, how raging the waters are, and what we're going to do. Really? Why do you think Joshua had those guys camp out at the base of the Jordan River for three days? Here's what I'm going to say about this. Don't ever underestimate how God uses experiences in your life to show his faithfulness. Don't ever underestimate how God uses experience in your life to show his faithfulness. They sit there at the Jordan River. They're staring at the Jordan River for three days as the waters are raging in order to show, I'm gonna do something work and I need you guys to see what you're gonna deal with and what I'm going, to do, uh, I'm going to do in your life. Because when you go to the Jordan River into this land that is unknown, you're going to have to grab upon these memories of how God has been faithful, how I have been faithful to you, in order to guide that every step of the way. Joshua, teach them how to use the words of God, help them to meditate, but now I'm going to show them memories in order for me to show I am faithful. Do not underestimate how God uses memories in your life, situations in your life to prove how faithful he is to you. Let me tell you a quick story as well too, okay? And then we're going to go on to the next point. I stand here right now. If you notice me, I have a lot of different water. Three years ago, the doctors told me that I was diagnosed with cancer in my sinus. That cancer was going to destroy everything inside of my nose and all of it inside my mouth. I stand here today with no saliva, little bit of taste buds. I, my hearing is down to 30% in my left ear. My ear is going bad. I'm down to about, eventually it's going to be down to 20, 30%. I have told, uh, tears in my eyes. I have no tears in my eyes. I live with headaches and pain throughout my body every single day. 
Two and a half years ago, when I was going through my chemo and radiation, the doctor says, you're going to be in pain, and I never understood that pain. And I lived in that pain. By week five of the radiation, I lived with pain every single day. That pain didn't stop everyone. That pain affected the inside of my nose, the inside of my mouth, the outside of my skin on my neck, and I lived with intense pain, and that led on for four weeks. I lost 80 pounds during those weeks because I couldn't eat. Every day, I sat in my home. Every day for those four weeks, I cried to the Lord, take away that pain. I can't deal with that pain anymore. Take away that pain. And you know what happened? The pain never left, went away. God was quiet during that period of time. And you know what I had to depend on every single day? I had to always remember God's faithfulness to me during those years. All of the memories of how he was faithful, I had to remember and I had to remember the truths of the scriptures here in this word to guide me those four or five weeks. Because folks, there are times in your life you're going to go through trials. You're going to go through hard times. You're not going to know what to do. And you're going to have to cling upon the words because you can't trust your heart. Your heart's going to tell you, be angry. Why is God doing this to you? But you're going to have to trust upon those words and cling upon those words as truth. And you're going to have to cling upon those memories to guide you every step of those days. That's what you're going to do. And do not underestimate that God will use memories in your life to guide you every step of the way. And he says this in this wonderful things. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried out by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. And watch this, underline this. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it. If you have an underlined pencil, highlighter, highlight this. Do not come near it. In order that you may know the way you shall go. For you have what? Not passed this way before, underline it, underline it. You've never passed this way before. You don't know. I know this. I've wrought, I, I gave you the promised land. I've determined your path. I've shown you what you need to do. Follow the Ark of the Covenant. In our case, follow the Holy Spirit. When I came and died on the cross, I gave you a new life. I've given you the Holy Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit in your life. Let the words of Scripture guide you. Let the memories of those guide you. But follow the Holy Spirit and allow you to really be able to give you direction for you don't know where you are going because you've never been in this way before. This morning I get out of bed, I see this text. It is a pastor friend of mine. He's a young adults pastor, youth pastor, with two little kids, two girls, one just born, about a year old, another one about five years old. He tells me, Tommy, my wife left us. She didn't want to live the pastor's wife life anymore. She picked up, left me with my two girls, and moved to New York to do what she always dreamed about. I don't know what to do. I had one of our other co-workers who recently said to me, Tommy, I, my dad has a spinal injury and he needs spine in surgery. My, wife, my mom has dementia and they both live with us. I also just want to let you know, my husband and I have been trying to go to marriage counseling for the last six months. It's not working. We're thinking about separating, but I can't separate because I've always been a stay-at-home mom until I started working part-time with you. I don't know if he divorces me and we separate, what am I going to do with money? How am I going to handle my parents? We have three kids in college. In this COVID season, some of you guys are dealing with loss of loved ones, wherever you are. You're dealing in situations in many countries, maybe where you are, where it's not safe to be a Christ follower. 
You're dealing with loss of jobs or loss of incomes because of COVID. Your business is shutting down. You may be on the brink of being laid off. You're looking at your savings account. You're trying to figure out what to do. You're dealing with kids who are acting out. You're dealing, you just had a baby. You don't know what to do. You're arguing with your spouse. There are situations in your life where you don't know what to do because you've never gone this way before. And God is saying, I understand. I've written your story. Your story is unique. No, I am part of that story. And as I led you to the promised land, Joshua, the same words that ring to Joshua, rings us to us. Meditate on your words day and night. Do not allow the words to depart from your mouth. Remember the memories of you, but follow the Ark of the Covenant. Follow the Holy Spirit because you have not been this way before. Sorry about that. And next one, question five. But consecrate. Oops, sorry about that. Consecrate yourselves. I am so, I'm getting used to it. Mark, sorry about this. I'm getting used to number five here. And then from that point on, it goes to this. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Consecrate yourselves for the Lord will do wonders among you. I'm going to send you on a journey. I'm going to send you through the promised land. After 40 years, I have a plan for you, says the Lord. Follow the Ark of the Covenant, for you have never been this way before. But before you do, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do what? Wonders among you. And that will be my last point. And what, what does it mean by wonders? Let's take a look at chapter 7, right? Sometimes, here, here's the thing I, I want to encourage you. You're sitting there, consecrate. What in the world does it mean, consecrate? If you have Google, just do Google. <coughs> go to BibleGateway.com. And in the book of Joshua, just do the word consecrate and see exactly how it appears. So here's what it says in verse 13 of chapter 7. The word consecrate appears twice in Joshua, it appears in chapter three, and now it appears in chapter seven. Here's what it says. Can't get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel, that you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things among you. Israelites, I'm going to do something powerful again for you. I'm going to lead you to the promised land. I'm going to write you a new story. And there you will become one of the greatest nations. But it's not going to be easy. You're going to go into a period where it is the unknown and you're not going to know what to do. But I will be with you because I will give you the Ark of the Covenant. I will give you the Holy Spirit. But before you do, and I'm going to do wonderful things in your life. But before you do, you know what I'm going to ask you? I want you to consecrate yourselves. I want you to take the devoted things away in your life. Where's your heart? What are the things in your life that God says to you when he says to consecrate? As you are sitting here right now, what does he have you to consecrate? What needs... To, what are some of the devoted things in your life that you need to come and deal with the Lord? Because he's going to want to do wonderful things about you. He has a story for you. He has wonderful things. He has a life plan out to you. But he's asking you to consecrate your life. To take the things in your heart, the devoted things in your heart, and get rid of it. And for some of us, it may be our plans. It may be the things that we want in our life, the things that we inherit our dreams, our goals. It may be that. For some of us, it may be guilt that you're dealing with. You're sitting here listening right now and you're just dealing with guilt. Some of you may be anger or jealousy. All of that. When God says to you, take out, consecrate yourselves. What is he saying to you? What is he asking you 
to give up and come before the Lord to devote the things in your life and bring out to him. Because he wants to do a wonderful thing in your life. He wants to do something that you can't even imagine. He wants to write a story in your life that's unique and do things and lead you on that journey. But before you do what, I need you to consecrate yourselves to take out the things in your life that will hinder my relationship with you. That becomes the whole gospel message, isn't it? That Jesus Christ, upon the death of his cross, dies for our sins. We live a matter of grace. It is not a matter by works. And he promises you that you have to come before the cross, come before him and say, Lord, I accept you into my life. And through that, he opens the door to a new journey. And he says to you, continue to follow the words I give you. Continue to follow the memories. Continue to follow the Holy Spirit I give you. But every single day, as I lead you on this unique journey, to consecrate yourself, to sanctify yourself, to continue to cleanse yourself of your heart and the things that will bring a divide between me and you. And so that becomes the question for you. What do you need to do to do business with God, to consecrate yourselves with him? Let's actually stick with four questions because we're out of time as well too. The role of gnome. What happens in Joshua chapter one that sets us up for chapter three? You are my leader. Do not depart from the word that I meditated on day and night. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to give you memories to show you I'm, uh, that I'm proving to be faithful. Do not ever underestimate how God is faithful in your life. Those memories, not only the word of God, but the memories. And he's going to give you the Holy Spirit to guide you every step of the way. But we do it in community together. And that's what our calling is as Christ followers. And along the way, consecrate yourselves. For there are devoted things in your heart that will affect that I want you to do business with. Jesus is there always in all parts of your life. But he calls us to work and follow him in this journey. On this wonderful adventure that he is ready to leave you. And he calls you on that path. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for how you speak to us each and every single day. Thank you for the journey you give us. Thank you for how you give us your word. You give us memories. And you give us the Holy Spirit. But you challenge us to consecrate, to come and continue to do business with you. And so, Lord, I lift those things up to you, dear Father. And to pray for all of us who are listening, Lord, that we continue to hear your voice and follow you in this journey, that we come before you and lay it all at your feet. In Christ we pray.